Welcome to Hot Chips 24. Session 3. Many Core and GPU. Okay, this is session three. I'm Alan Smith. I'm the session chair for this session. The title of the session is Many Core and GPU. We have two AMD speakers to follow our keynote, so you sh hopefully there will be a, a common thread here. Our first speaker is going to be Michael Mantor, who's going to be talking about the AMD HD7970 graphics core next, or GCN architecture. Um, Undoubtedly, they did not use a poet to name these things. Uh, Mike is a senior fellow at AMD with interests in computer architecture, particularly performance, GPU programmability, and power reduction. Uh, more re most recently, he led the Graphics Core Next architecture definition and development, which has a new ISA and includes a non-VLIW unified shader microarchitecture with a unified read-write memory cache hierarchy. Mike joined ATI Technologies in 1999 and worked on the development of all of the AMD, ATI, Radeon, APUs, and GPUs since the start of the Radeon series in 2000. Uh, he joined AMD with the ATI acquisition in 2006. Previously, he began his career at Lockheed Martin, where he designed and tested advanced night vision systems. Uh, just if the lights go out, we may need his expertise. Uh, he earned his BS and EE from San Diego State and did graduate work in DSP, Digital Signal Processing, at University of Central Florida. Uh, Mike? Thank you, Alan. Good afternoon. It's uh, really an honor to be here at Great Chips again. Uh, this is my second time. I've been about six or seven years now since I've been here uh, before. Uh, it really is my pleasure to be here to represent AMD, uh, or uh, to talk about our Graphics Core Next architecture, uh, to represent my colleagues in, in uh, really uh, discuss how architecture is changing. It really is a, an exciting time to be involved in computer architecture. Uh, today I'll share with you some of the details about both our, our latest uh, Graphics Core family that came out, and we'll kind of emphasize the 7970. And uh, we'll talk about the, what we call the Graphics Core Next architecture uh, within that. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time and talk about that. Every time before we actually start a product development, um, we really start it significantly before we get started. So you can think that about the last time I was talking uh, here at Hot Chips, uh, six years ago, uh, we, we were already contemplating how to change the architecture. And, and bigger changes take longer to plan, and you really do have to plan. So while we're uh, committed to delivering a uh, new product every year that has an interesting performance uh, improvement or new features that are either visible or give a new user experience, or indirectly they give developers ability to develop new features that are available um, and visible to the users. And so we set out uh, to, to stick to our time to market, so we really thought about when to introduce this change um, that we'll talk about today. There's really three major components that go into the, the changes this time. Um, we had a definite goal to um, minimize the power required for given workloads in the new architecture to make architectural changes that help improve our power uh, dynamics across the workloads that come across. And we made the conscious decision uh, after uh, four or five years of really looking at GP, GPU, compute to make compute a first class uh, uh, client of the unified shader core that was inside of our, our graphics core. Um, this was a conscious decision that was kind of be ma being made at the same time the, the foundations of the HSA architecture was coming along. It, it was already understood that we had platforms that had uh, 
bigger and bigger GPUs that were more capable uh, present there and, and that we could really leverage that kind of compute in many different application workloads. So there was, there was already a knowledge. Uh, a, a lot of things have developed and co-developed along the way, um, but, but that knowledge to make compute first class was, was already established. Um, then, uh, uh, so we, we move into this new architecture where uh, we really concentrated on some areas where uh, we developed a new ISA and a new compiler alongside of it. The, the two really go uh, hand in hand. I spent a, a lot of time with our, our uh, compiler team really picking and choosing how we did uh, instruction encoding to be able to drive the microarchitecture of the machine that we'll talk about today. Um, we, we also went to a, a distributed compute system that really gave us a chance to have the best uh, microarchitecture again instead of having uh, to, to get program control flow and our separate compute units all independently capable of controlling things. Uh, we, we went to a global read-write cache. Uh, over the few years before this, we really added general purpose read and write with scatter gather kind of capabilities, the ability to do atomic operations, but they were through separate read and write paths. Uh, we, we knew the time had come to finally go to a, a truly read write cache hierarchy on chip. <coughs> uh, again, uh, to both improve the latency and the performance of the workloads, but to reduce power as well. Um, we also added what we call asynchronous compute engines, which allow uh, parallel tasks to be launching and distributing work at the same time from a compute perspective as well as graphics. You can think when we do a draw call on a graphics, we do a vertex shader and a pixel shader, uh, along with a fixed function pipeline to drive those, or in the, in the later uh, graphics pipelines, there's other stages of, of compute that actually get sent into the unified shader core. We really envision in compute, we're gonna have similar kind of uh, efforts going on. Um, and last but not least, we added ECC in the high-end version of these chips, both, uh, and, and we'll get into some more detail about that uh, after a bit. It, additionally, AMD has pushed an uh, Ifinity display system where a single large surface can be displayed across mon multiple monitors. Uh, in, in addition, a uh, full 3D uh, display, stereo display to support, and um, in very flexible audio, which we'll briefly cover uh, today. So here is the chip at the top level, um, 4.3 billion 28 nanometer transistors. Um, again, I said we, we spent a lot of time on power analysis, and now Mark talked a little bit about this. Uh, at the lowest level inside of our graphics core, we do very fine uh, clock gating everywhere possible. We do organizations of, of local clock trees, sometimes by function, so that we can clock gate uh, different parts of the fixed function pipeline that are not being used, so they can be very quickly monitored and turned on and off to minimize the, the total dynamic power. Uh, by, by saving the clock tree power. And then in addition, at the next level, we have power tune. And this is, um, it's, it's been referenced in many ways, but we really have monitoring circuits all over to be able to predict what the power is going to be based on activity of the workloads so that we can very smartly monitor what's going on across the chip and know how to adjust the frequency and voltage to really uh, stay power contained on one side of it when you get applications that can go crazy and wild. But on the other side of it, it actually allows us to increase the frequency and or voltage when different circuits are naturally turned off because of state settings that are, that are inside the device. And then we have uh, zero core power, which uh, was introduced in this product family where we actually just turn off everything but the bus interface on the graphics card to go to sub three watt on, on these big uh, chips for uh, really low power when the display is, is turned off. At the heart of this architecture is 32 of these compute units on, on the 7970, and, and we'll go into the details of what, what I call non-VLIW ISA um, in, in a section after we kind of go through the top level. Um, but the distributed compute units each have their own control flow execution units. We'll talk about the execution units that make these uh, compute units standalone, multi-threaded compute units in each one of them. Uh, they support completely 32 and 64 
bit full IEEE 2008 floating point for, uh, uh, mathematics, and we have integer and logic uh, operations that share the same uh, pipelines and a lot of the logic reuse inside the pipe in the floating point pipelines again to minimize power and and reduce size. Uh, we also have uh, several video op flavors that have been put in here to really facilitate uh, some of the encoding and search patterns in, in video algorithms. And each uh, compute unit has its own uh, texture load store unit, and again is is a combined unit to to conserve on power and make full use of the area that's there, uh, and, a, and a texture L1 cache, as we'll see. The, the new unified read-write uh, cache that's applied um, allows uh, the 384-bit memory interface that was, was chosen for this design that could run as, as uh, in, in some of the, the latest version in the gigahertz edition, can run all the way up to 6 gigabits per pin. Um, and in the introduction, uh, I think it, it will be on one of the spec sheets later. I'll probably blow it if I say what it was. Um, but behind that uh, memory interface is 12 channels or 12 partitions of, of L2 cache that is unified. Uh, it's, a, it's a right back 768K byte of storage that's there. Um, so this is the chip's view of memory when we're inside of any of the shader complex or the command stream. Inside of each uh, compute unit, there's a 16K byte read-write L1 cache, and that's a write-back cache. Uh, I'm sorry, a, a write-through cache. And uh, there's a 16K byte instruction cache and a, uh, a 32K byte uh, scalar read-only data cache that's associated with each four compute units and shared across them. Um, this chip was equipped with PCI Gen 3 to double the bandwidth over the previous chips, and there was also improvements in, in this version of the uh, PCI spec to, to reduce the, some of the communication overheads of the protocol as well. We additionally include uh, a global data share block, which is um, a data share unit. When we, when we talk about the one that's inside the compute unit, this one is, is very similar in nature. It can do read, write, coalesced reads and writes and atomic operations. It's also equipped with some global synchronization mechanisms um, that are, are non-pulling or, or non-overhead where wavefronts can make requests to synchronize with others. Uh, there's there's uh, programmable name semaphores, uh, counting semaphores that are in there that can allow when, when a certain number of of uh, work items are, are ready to batch off to do the next part of a job can do that. Um, there's also order to pin in a pin circuits there. And again, this having this uh, secondary path, if you're doing a pinned operations where uh, a, a wavefront's basically, or a work group's allocating space in, into a compressed output buffer while you're actually running, you can go through this, this secondary uh, on-chip memory structure to, to get the uh, ordered or unordered allocation space without interfering with the memory patterns of the compacted data that's actually being written to, to memory through the L2 channels or consumed. Um, the graphics pipe does look pretty similar to our previous graphics pipe. There's dual geometry engines, there's dual rastering engines, there's eight render back ends to do the depth, uh, color, uh, blending and, and stencil operations and depth test. There's up, up to 128 uh, Z tests that can happen per clock. Um, the, the graphics pipe went through several improvements here where, where on-chip buffering at different places have been adjusted and tuned for applications uh, from, from the previous generation. Vertex reuse, uh, both pre uh, uh, in, in the DX9 pipeline, DX10 and DX11 pipeline have been, the reuse depth has been improved so that we uh, more effectively uh, filter out vertices that don't need to be reprocessed. Um, and there's been uh, several improvements in the uh, stencil and, and uh, alpha tests that are happening in the color unit as well. <coughs> and our dual asynchronous compute engines are really two full independent engine pipelines that can schedule, have uh, a scheduled task on the, on the computing unit. Um, they can run completely asynchronous to each other and asynchronous to the graphics core submit work to get better utilization of the shader uh, array, 
There's also two supporting uh, asynchronous DMA engines inside the, the chip that can, again, independently be controlled. Uh, there's also semaphore mechanisms for on-chip on synchronization or synchronization back to the uh, applications that uh, submitted the work. We, again, I said we, we added compute or ECC for the compute mode of operation. It's uh, single error correct, double error detect. The single error correct really, um, when turned on, helps any workload that exists on the, on the uh, graphics core. Um, and the double error detect and single error correct uh, statistics are reported uh, through counters. The protected devices are all the registers that are in the compute unit, the scalar and vector register sets, all of the data caches, all the L1 caches that we talked about, the L2 cache, and all of the data share memories in, inside the compute unit and the global data share. Uh, and and uh, this device supports all the latest APIs, OpenCL 1.2, Direct Compute of DirectX 11.1, and C++ AMP. Uh, in the multimedia arena, this iFinity display really allows a single 16K by 16K image to be displayed across 16 display systems, or 16 individual displays. That can either be a large surface or it can be six different uh, render targets that are being displayed. Um, additionally, uh, that can be used to drive three uh, stereo 3D displays. And um, uh, many improvements have been made with the flexible um, bezel uh, controls so that you can have many different configurations. In this choice here, you see that there's two, two monitors on the side that are smaller. The image is still pers perspectively correct across the uh, displays. And, um, there's a reference at the end, you can uh, go check a white paper and there's a, a, a whole slew of configurations that these things can be put together on. Uh, <clears throat> the discrete digital uh, multi-port audio allows a unique audio stream to be sent to, to the three different displays um, so that you can have uh, teleconferencing um, and there's also an audio engine that can do directional audio um, for new high-performance audio. Then there's a, a fixed function, discrete universal video decoder that's included that can uh, do the decode for all the common uh, uh, codecs that exist. Um, this is, again, for low power. It's uh, uh, completely capable of doing multi-streams. And then on the, uh, uh, again, a discrete video encode engine that can uh, do H.264 high definition encoding. Again, it can encode multiple streams. This, this uh, device also has a, an ability to coordinate with the shader array to uh, do higher performance or unique algorith encoding algorithms for, for uh, better encoding results. Um, and we include the crossfire controller that really uh, facilitates the data moves, peer-to-peer uh, -peer kind of moves and peer back or host uh, back to the host for uh, multi-GPU uh, uh, operations, and we support dual, triple, and quad uh, chip support for that. Push the wrong button there. Um, and, and, and next, uh, you know, I kind of said that we had to have a lot of planning. <clears throat> the other thing, we, we have to deliver multiple versions of the product, and, and so when we build our database, really, that, that uh, uh, controls the creation of these devices, we put something in called feature flags, and we control uh, these feature configuration flags that quickly allow us to build multiple versions of the same architecture in different configurations. So some of the uh, bigger knobs are uh, the ability to control the number of memory channels, L2 partition and I.O. pins, uh, the ability to control the vertex rate, primitive rate, and pixel rates, the number of compute units, and the number of textures, uh, and the 64-bit float and point uh, computational rates, we can run at half, uh, quarter, or 16th rate, and, and we could choose to do eighth rate as well. And the ECC options are completely programmable. Uh, the one thing I'm gonna point on here is here for your reference, but you can see that we delivered the first product, uh, uh, started delivering late December, early January. In February came the second configuration. In March came the third configuration. And it, it is a lot about time to market, getting to market before your competitor refreshes. 
allows you to stand in with new stuff for a while and really leverage uh, what you've done. And uh, we ended up with a lot of headroom and we was easy both with a compiler and driver improvements as well as um, uh, actual frequency headroom that we had in this design to release a gigahertz edition in June. Um, this, for your reference, uh, so die shots. Uh, the compute unit itself is the basic building block of, of this new um, architecture. So this uh, block diagram that you can see, uh, the non-VLIW, uh, again, we kind of covered most of the stuff, the different parts that are in there. Uh, here's a schematic view of this. And here's where you can kind of see that we're kind of stepping into more traditional architecture um, because we have uh, pr uh, program counters and instruction buffers for every thread of execution that can go on in the, in the machine. And when I say thread, I really mean wavefront or a group of threads that execute together on a SIMD. So these program counts and instruction buffers figure out what instructions need to be fetched next, and they arbitrate um, back through to the memory system to go down to the shared instruction cache to fetch data into there. So this is kind of like a traditional uh, uh, CPU even, a multi-threaded CPU where we're really doing instruction fetch on one side. And if you come to the other side of the instruction buffer, we have execution units with an arbitration between the execution units, or an arbiter for e each execution unit to deliver work to the execution unit across from the multiple threads that are there. So kind of quickly, uh, we, we have a, a, a dedicated branch unit that does um, branch operations with fixed offsets. We have an export and GDS uh, operation that does export operations to the uh, fixed function pipeline. This like parameters, positions, colors uh, that, that go off um, to, to the rest, back into the graphics pipeline. Then we have a vector memory um, engine that actually does load stores and image ops. So you can read or write or do atomic operations on all the, those types. And again, the ISA was redone for these so that uh, it could be optimal. Uh, then we have a, a, the next unit there is a scalar decode for a, 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 a uh, arithmetic uh, scalar unit that has registers and can issue control flow kind of operations. It can do uh, uniform instructions instead of doing it in the vector engine. Um, then we have a vector decode and we have four vector units or four SIMDs of which uh, the vector unit does decode and issue for all four of those. Uh, it's one issue with four decode at the same time. And then on the bottom we have the LDS uh, decode to go into the shared memory unit. Um, and we're going to kind of go quick here. There's an ability in the shared memory to supply single argument parameters into uh, the, the vector instructions, or there's peer shared memory where two vector engines can make re request in here. Uh, since we have 32 bank memory, we can service a 64 length vector instruction and two opcodes when they're coalesced. Uh, this provides a low latency path, high bandwidth, has twice the bandwidth that comes out of the L1, so it accelerates operation. Um, I'm going to leave these for your reference, but basically uh, they illustrate in the VLIW versus Scalar that uh, when you have non-dependent operations like we had in graphics, you, you could do things in a very non-dependent way and we could get very good utilization. When we start getting to general purpose compute, there ends up being um, conflicts that prevent you from getting full utilization. And by splitting the, the unit into... Uh, four independent SIMDs that are 16 wide of scalar issue versus 16 wide four scalar issues, we, we become uh, occupancy limited. We need to have four wave fronts versus uh, uh, program uh, dependencies that block you from getting utilization. We have lots of workloads, so when we're going for throughput, we, we have the wave fronts and uh, we get good results. We get much better programming model, you can see that we're a collection of vector and scalar instructions uh, that cooperate together, and then the, the memory instructions and whatnot, it is a, a scalar list of instructions. The front instructions uh, is always trying to arbitrate. The multi-threaded nature gives us multiple wave fronts to select instructions for. <clears throat> this ISA is much easier to uh, code to, to debug for, uh, and whatnot. Um, again, here's a summary of most of what we went through. I want to real quickly uh, cover the cache hierarchy. Um, we've, we've said the size and kind of shown how they're interconnected together. 
Again, the L1s are, are right through and the L2s are right back. Um, and uh, the global data share is facilitated with a, using the export path to get to it, and it returns to one of the compute units at a time. Uh, relaxed memory model. Uh, all work items in the same work group go to the same L1, see the same data at the L1. Uh, all work items of different work groups could be on different L1s, so their only point of coherence is at the L2. Uh, <coughs> the command stream as well as the work groups all can access memory through the L2 and see the same uh, view of memory. And there are uh, instructions that allow control of when data is going to be visible. Uh, there are sufficient primitives associated with the, with the ISA and the hardware to implement a C++11 uh, memory model. Um, this uh, acquire release semantics allows the compiler to rationalize how he can move code and maintain coherency across this. The L2 cache is a big, uh, um, the read-write mechanism allows us to really save power and reduce external uh, bandwidth by any read-write transactions hidden in the cache. Also, the L2 has remote atomics, uh, so each L2 channel can do a full set of a cache line worth of atomics um, at rate, uh, so you pack up data and send it out, it's done remotely with the pre-op value being returned. So, this architecture provides a very heavy, multi-threaded um, compute unit uh, that can be applied to really maximize throughput. We've made many improvements to really improve the utilization to get the performance per millimeter and performance per watt up. A lot of uh, dynamic power management to control and, and make the, uh, the device uh, uh, very capable in, in managing uh, the resources going on. And with that, I see my time's up, Alan. I told you I'd use it all. Thank you very much. No, that was that was very good. I've I've warned my speakers that that they should keep their peripheral vision up, and as I start edging toward them, it's a signal that their time is running out. Uh, but Mike actually finished a couple of minutes early. Um, so we have time for a couple of questions. If there are any questions, hi, uh, this is Dan Kai Wang. I'm from Qualcomm. I have a question about uh, probably the page slide 21, I guess. Yeah, so you said you, you're, you're not like, you're not traditional VIW machine, so you have a different, like this, this one, uh, I'm sorry, the next slide. So you, uh, your data will need to, instead of having a BNC in the SIMDX, you have to have BNC in X, Y, Z, and W. So is there overhead to kind of uh, spread your data like that? In, in the VLIW machine? In your, your machine. In, in our original VLIW machine, um, when, when, when the compiler scheduled four operations, now the register port is set up so that you can actually pull all the data out at once. But as soon as you add a dependency where the second scalar operation, the B term actually comes from the first scalar operation. So you, you, I'm sorry, the A term. So you have to actually do this calculation before you can get this input to the second operation. So there becomes a dependency, and they can't be co-issued in the same VLIW instruction bu uh, uh, bundle. Mm -hmm. They have to be separated out and executed independently. Um, which lane it runs in is, is, is kind of independent because there's plenty of muxing coming out of the register files to steer them. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact is you can't utilize all the lanes when you have this instruction dependency going on. Right, but like, like this one, so you got like B, plus C on all then X, and then the next cycle you do A plus C. But wouldn't it be possible like you could actually do B and C, and then next thread you do A plus D, and also B and C for the next element. A again, A is dependent right, I mean, I mean, there, and B is dependent here, and C is dependent here. So each one of them are dependent. Uh, well, we can discuss Yeah, offline. we can take it offline. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, this, this, this is one more question. This is the last one. Thank you. Pramod Argadai from Qualcomm. Uh, uh, you mentioned that you support OpenCL 1.2, and this standard is quite uh, challenging, particularly for uh, trigonometric functions, where it requires uh, four ULP in the entire operand range. Mm -hmm. um, 
so do you support 4 ELP for the entire, for 32 and 64 bits? Um, in hardware? I, we, we do supply uh, less than 4 ULP. I'm not sure it's across all full range. I will have to double check on that, but it, it, we're passing the OpenCL 1.2 conformance specific, or, you know, test. Okay, thank um, you. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very, very much. Delightful talk. Great. All of my speakers actually did several revisions of their slides, several of them actually in the last three or four days, so some of the slides are as much of a new to me as to you. Our next speaker is going to be Sebastian Nussbaum, who's speaking in the AMD Trinity Fusion APU. Uh, Sebastian has 11 years of experience in the microprocessor industry. He's the lead architect at AMD for the Trinity, SOC, and other client APUs in development. He joined AMD in 2004 from Sun Microsystems and then started working at AMD on CPU core microarchitecture. <coughs> he has more than 20 patents granted or filed in the fields of power management, hybrid system architecture, and CPU core microarchitecture. He has a master's in ECE from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2001 and a BS from Supalec, which I believe is École Normale Supérieure d'Electricité, a school of electricity in France. He's married with two children who apparently strongly protested his coming out here without them. Uh, Sebastian? Thank you. Good morning, or good afternoon, sorry. Um, so I'd like to uh, introduce you to uh, the Trinity APU architecture. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today to represent the entire, the entire Trinity design team uh, who is really responsible for the successful development of a very complex APU. And if you've seen the presentation this morning from Ivy Bridge and the one today, you'll see that APUs are becoming very, very challenging, complex developments. And so it's a, um, you know, it's, a, it's a good lesson to actually walk through some of the critical features and design choices that we made to actually go for those. Um, okay, so let's go. Uh, first off, I'd like to introduce by, you know, how, what are sort of the design goals that we created for uh, Trinity. So Trinity is a follow-on to Lano, which is a mainstream fusion APU. And uh, initially, we basically looked at the amount of, uh, you know, capa capabilities we'll require for an APU. And they basically fall back into CPU performance, GPU performance, multimedia capabilities, and display and connectivity. So if you look at CPU performance, uh, Trinity achieves over 25% performance gains um, versus the prior APU Lano in the in the 35 watt space, and more than 50% graphics performance uh, in the space of 35 watt APUs again uh, versus Lano. So these are very significant achievements. The graphics core is based on um, the second generation graphics core capable of DirectX 11. And the CPU is a pile driver, which is a follow-on to Bulldozer, and we'll spend some time talking about the improvements in performance, power, and IPC feature that went in there. Oops. Um, and then the multimedia capabilities were enhanced with uh, a video compression engine, which can be used for several purposes. One would be for transcoding applications, so you can actually do quick transcode. The other one is for um, uh, video conferencing at low power and also for smoothing wireless display capabilities. So this is a very significant improvement for, uh, for client applications, and, and Mike talked about some of those. And then um, lastly, for the um, display capabilities, um, Trinity now supports uh, Ifinity, which is the ability to actually connect up to three different displays and um, spread surfaces, as Mike was describing earlier, uh, as well as going up to four display heads if you're using DisplayPort uh, multi-stream. So it's a significant display connectivity improvement. Uh, this is a uh, dive floor plan for, um, a dive photo for uh, Trinity. Trinity is a 32 nanometer SOI, um, 246 millimeter square with uh, roughly 1.3 billion transistor. Um, if you look at that floor plan, at the top here you have the 264-bit channel of DDR3 controller. Um, Listed on the top right-hand corner, the accelerators for video decode and video encode. In the middle, uh, be sandwiched between the two x86 modules that are effectively four uh, pile driver cores and the DDR controller, you see the North Bridge, which is the center of coherency, so it wants to be placed at low latency between the CPUs and memory um, because latency matters uh, significantly for CPU workloads. 
And then the GPU occupies roughly about half of the real estate that is not used for files and analog components and PLLs and so forth. Um, and comes with a graphics memory controller, which is used to schedule efficiently requests across thousands of outstanding requests to memory from the GPU. So these requests have to be efficiently arbitrated to make sure that you get the maximum utilization out of uh, the DRAMs. And then on the left-hand side here is the uh, two XCD6, uh, dual XCD6 modules, which, are, which make up four pile driver cores, and then they're uh, two megabyte L2 uh, each. And we'll spend some time talking about the pile driver uh, core improvements. At the bottom here, you have the display PLLs and display files, which is where the connectivity comes, and then the uh, display controller. And then PCI Express, uh, interfaces uh, to connect up to discrete cards or additional display capabilities in certain notebook configuration with a docking station or other and connection to the uh, South Bridge. So let's talk a little, little bit about the pile driver core that went into uh, Trinity. So significant effort was, was placed on, on the development of a new core uh, follow-on to Bulldozer. Uh, obviously, significantly leverages the bulldozer architecture. So, uh, some of the main premises is a decoupled branch prediction pipeline from a branch and address prediction pipeline from the fetch, uh, so that you can have a very complex uh, branch and address prediction algorithms because it's really not completely coupled to your to your fetching. So, uh, this this gives some significant performance opportunities. We also have uh, dual integer execution clusters that have uh, dedicated data cache and a shared floating point unit. Some of the improvements that we made is we grew the uh, iCache size to 64 kilobytes and then went with a four-way x86 decoder um, instead of a three-way in the prior generation. And then the floating point unit supports um, dual 128-bit uh, FMA operations. And then shared L2, two megabytes, 16 ways that associative shared between the, uh, the, the two clusters. Um, the Integer cores are similar in the architecture to Bulldozer with a, uh, a physical register file at the heart of the renaming algorithms and a way predicted um, L1 cache, uh, which we've added uh, for power efficiency uh, way prediction to the cache. The um, uh, instruction set architecture was augmented by uh, the addition of FME3 and um, half precision floating point convert operations supports lightweight profiling and hardware, and um, the, the overall performance gains from, this, from, uh, from the uh, design point, uh, power reduction, frequency gain, and IPC gives up to 15% for desktop and 25% gains for notebooks. The CPU is also optimized for uh, Turbo Core 3, uh, which we'll talk about in the later part of this presentation. So just a quick floor plan. Uh, you can see here the two clusters mirrored um, in the center with the uh, uh, load store units and um, uh, L1D cache. And at the bottom, you see the floating point unit, which occupies roughly about a third or 30% of the core proper that doesn't include the L2 cache. And at the top of the, of the uh, floor plan here, uh, you can see on the, on the top left-hand side, the branch and address prediction pipeline, which includes all the predictor, cap predictor structures. And then in the middle, the... Um, the decoder, so these are about the same size. And then on the top right-hand side, the um, L1 instruction cache. Uh, so some of the uh, IPC improvements that went into the, uh, the architecture, so we've, we've introduced a novel um, uh, state-of-the-art branch prediction level two capability. So uh, Bulldozer supported a hybrid branch predictor, uh, but because we have a decoupled address prediction pipeline, we're actually able to uh, create a second order uh, prediction that does deeper prediction using a very sophisticated algorithm um, that eventually corrects the uh, first level hybrid prediction scheme that we have and uh, takes a few cycle penalty only to the prediction pipeline, not to the actual fetch pipeline. Uh, so as long as you can, you can, uh, your address prediction pipeline can run ahead of your, your fetch cycle, you, have, you, you don't see a performance penalty, but you get better branch prediction accuracy. Uh, the, al the other um, improvements that we made is through uh, prefetching efficiency, both inside the L2 cache as well as inside the L1 cache. So prefetching improvements that you can think of, uh, uh, obviously being more aggressive with prefetching, but also being more uh, selective with prefetching, making sure you put it, you put your prefetching in the cache locations that are not going to be um, um, causing evictions to demand fetches. Also, being making sure the, uh, the prefetching algorithm plays nicely with out of order uh, memory operations, which otherwise can conflict with each other and actually cause um, negative performance gains. 
We've added a hardware divider unit, so this, this adds uh, significant performance for uh, certain types of integer workloads, and improved uh, floating point and integer scheduling uh, to make sure that we've got better picking algorithms that are more friendly to um, operation readiness. Uh, we've also grown the TLB structures uh, to make sure that we can accommodate larger uh, footprints of workloads, and then uh, created a fairly comprehensive store load forwarding improvement that relies on better heuristics that scan across the variable uh, across a large window of uh, memory operations currently pending and uses different heuristics before the address is even resolved as to what uh, specific operation is trying to get to, whether these be based on um, you know, offsets or, or instruction types, but also uh, you know, trying as soon as the address becomes available, trying to find some, some early uh, prediction. Uh, besides um, IPC features, which by themselves um, are fairly substantial over bulldozer, we've also added um, improvements in the design constraints, uh, that would be frequency and power. The operational point for pile driver is about 30% higher frequency than at the same voltage as Lano uh, CPU, which was the star family, in the same process. So this is very significant frequency gains. And the core was designed to operate efficiently all the way from 0.8 volts to 1.3 volts. So the reason why you want to have such a large operational range is because in client space, there's really only two modes that you're running at. You either have a single thread running, and it's running at maximum frequency, maximum voltage, so you need high performance at that high frequency, and also be able to scale the frequency very high, because you have the power headroom, or you have a video and code application that's running and spegging all your cores, and you need to run at a lower frequency, but you want to make sure that frequency isn't degraded. So it creates a, a, good, a good incentive to optimize the design at all, at, at the entire spectrum, not just for one design point. Uh, we've lowered the dynamic power versus bulldozer by 10%. Uh, this is through you know, usual techniques of finer clock gating, whatever you're not, you, you know, if you're not using something, just don't, don't clock it. But also adding loop predictors and weight predictors and doing some uh, clever design improvements in terms of usage of higher power flops. Um, and overall, if you look at the result, it's about a 50% frequency increase in base frequency for Trinity versus Lano, which, which, uh, which represents effectively the frequency you could achieve at a given high power workload for a given um, thermal power. So this is very high amount of frequency upside. Uh, power management improvements. Um, so the uh, critical aspect of the core besides uh, that, you know, power reduction that I was intrinsic in the design and predictors is also making sure that we have fast in and out of power getting state, which requires being able to flush the L2 cache quickly, knowing exactly where the dirty data could be located as well as um, uh, saving and restoring the, the core micro-architected um, state quickly so that you can enter power gating state more aggressively uh, based on hints from the OS. So let's talk about um, media processing uh, acceleration. Uh, Trinity supports um, um, video decoding capabilities that support MPEG-2, um, uh, VC1, and uh, DivX and also uh, capable up to dual HD playback and or Blu-ray 3D playback uh, on select OPNs, mostly the ones that we obviously the ones that, that uh, you know, if you're not pegging your entire system into compute operations. Um, the, the key adder on multimedia versus Lano is in the order of the video, converti uh, video converter oper um, unit, uh, which is capable of encoding videos in H.264 multi-stream and is very power efficient and can encode uh, faster than a 1080p at 60 frames per second. So you can use it for um, transcode application or for smoothing wireless display uh, or for uh, video chat uh, that would be a smaller resolution. Uh, the video encoder can take its input either from the frame buffer directly, so if you've got an application that's a transcode and you want to accelerate that, or for uh, uh, video conferencing, but it can also take it directly from the uh, display outputs if you're trying to do an operation uh, associated with wireless display. It's a, um, it's a new IP that AMD designed that is uh, standalone in the sense that it doesn't require any additional processing by the CPU. The CPU is only used for purposes of rate control and uh, feedback of, of the actual uh, produced, uh, produced quality of the output but it has its own dedicated motion estimation hardware function, entropy encoder, um, and transform operations. Okay, um, GPU core designs that went into Trinity. Uh, so as Mike uh, alluded to earlier, uh, we've, we've now went to the uh, graphics core next. 
Um, Trinity GPU is based on the second generation of GPU core that's, that's DirectX 11 capable. It's also Shader Model 5 compliant and OpenCL 1.1 and Direct Compute 11 compliant. So the way it's organized is uh, we have six SIMDs that each um, have a eight kilobyte L1 cache that they share, and the each SIMD has a, an associated 32 kilobyte local data share. Each of the six SIMDs can, communi <coughs> can communicate globally via a global data share, as Mike was mentioning earlier, um, for global communication and synchronization among the SIMDs. And then they share a, a four 128 kilobyte L2 cache, making up total 512K L2. Um, the SIMDs are organized into stream, streaming processing units that are four-way VLIW um, processors. Uh, this is different than Lano, which was used based on five-way VLIW operation. So what we did is we looked at the uh, efficiency of a five-way VLIW versus four-way, and for graphics operation, we realized that the fifth-way VLIW did not actually buy a, um, a s enough performance for the return that it was costing in, in terms of area and power. So going to four-way VLIW allowed us to add additional, an additional SIMD within the design at the similar area as Lano, and as well as raising the frequency because the power was better um, for a given throughput. Um, the resulting um, backend uh, supports 32 stencil and depth operation per clock and eight color operation per clock. And the design supports 20, uh, 24x multi-sample and super sampling and 16x anisotropic filtering. We've also made substantial uh, compute improvements in this core, uh, mainly with the addition of uh, asynchronous um, uh, dispatch operation, which uh, allow multiple compute kernels to be uh, running simultaneously on the GPU, each with their own uh, private context and uh, address space. Okay, so, so where do we go with uh, performance achievements from these? So we looked at a range of workloads, um, and obviously for multimedia, work, for multimedia workloads, there's a different type of operations that you want to use. One would be transcode operation. Um, so this is what we call digital media suite. And we've looked at different type of, of applications, and we get to somewhere between uh, 20 to 40%, depending on the application. Uh, so this is very substantial gain, some of them due to ISA differences. Um, and these, uh, these performance gains are comprehensive of both IPC gains, uh, frequency increase at a given power level, and power management improvements. For productivity, um, and, um, which includes you know, compression and cryptography operations, uh, it's a similar view. The, the range of performance gains is somewhere in the 20 to, to 35%, with some outliers that go all the way to 60% gains on some, um, some key applications that, that um, our customers use typically. So the performance uh, gains for the CPU are substantial compared to Lano. Um, this is a little bit of a, of a harder to read chart, but if you look at the top uh, right, at the top left corner, uh, you'll see a representation of the graphics performance as measured by 3D Mark Vantage. The top green line represents the top end Trinity that, that is shipping today, and uh, the lines that are below represent the comparable points that would be uh, from Lano and Trinity selling at different price points. And so the first, uh, the, the highest performing Lano part that is currently uh, shipping is um, a Trinity achieves about 50% higher graphics performance than the highest um, Lano performance that was shipped, Lano part that they're shipping today. And then on, on general performance as measured by PC Mark Vantage, the uh, Delta is about 25% uh, higher performance for, for Trinity. Now these would be, these are all measured for 35 watt uh, TDP OPNs, which represents a uh, mid ground into the, uh, you know, between the low parts that would be shipping at 17 watts all the way to the desktop parts. Um, on battery life, uh, we'll talk a little bit later, but uh, significant improvements on battery life for idle power and mobile mark. And then general compute capacity, so as measured by the total amount of gigaflops available on the SOC, uh, goes up by 50% between Lano and Trinity, all the way to 600 gigaflops. I want to talk a little bit about the Turbo Core 3 technology, which was introduced with uh, Trinity. So we realized um, uh, fairly early on as, as we looked at Trinity that obviously the benefit uh, to performance of power management was going to be increasingly important because of the uh, reduction in uh, power consumption for all the APUs that we're shipping today and getting to smaller and smaller form factor. And also looked at the uh, thermal simulations across the die as how much uh, temperature gradient do we expect for a peak workload between uh, the CPU hotspot or the GPU hotspot, depending on workload you're running. And 
um, not surprisingly, we see up to you know 10 to 20 degrees C of difference depending on the hotspots on the die, depending on the type of workload you're running, and they can shift around uh, uh, depending on the dynamis dynamism of the application. So what we did is we divided the chip into a, uh, we wanted to find an opportunity to, to reap that benefit and identify where is the hotspot without necessarily relying uh, solely on, sen on thermal sensors, which we have on the chip, uh, but trying to, to to create a deterministic operation of the chip while trying to quantify the temperature at a given hotspot. So we've divided the chip into what we call thermal entities, which, are, uh, which can apply to either an x86 core module or to a GPU core or to a uh, PHY or to a Northbridge, which can identify their own calculated power based on the on instrumentation to these units. And at the same time, we try to calculate the temperature of that power based on a, on a, on a fairly elaborate um, model of the thermal coupling and resistance between the die and the, uh, the, the lid and the heat sink and the fan and approximating this whole thermal system with a five-stage thermal RC ladder. So the result is effectively a calculated temperature um, that should result fairly well into, the, into a deterministic uh, uh, temperature point as long as the system is running within the spec TDP conditions because it's, it's, you know, it's therm flow simulations that have been, been around for quite a while. Um, the, obviously, if the chip is not running within TDP condition and somebody is, is, uh, you know, is, is in a hot environment or you know, has the fan blocked or others, then that's where the, uh, we, we also make sure that the network of sensors that we have on die is used to make sure that we, we can detect when we're out of the um, uh, standard operational zone that you'd expect the chip to run at. In order to support this mechanism, uh, we had to use a, uh, rely fairly heavily on on die microcontroller to perform the uh, calculation. And when you looked at the results uh, that we're seeing empirically, the green line that you see at the bottom here is the measured um, hotspot temperature. And the three other lines that you see here would be the calculated temperature for either an x86 core module or the GPU. So what you want is you want the measured temperature to always be lower than what the chip thinks it's running at. So this way you always have headroom. And so the top graph here represents 3 mark vintage. The bottom is a CPU power virus. And what you can see is both of these graphs is that we achieve somewhere within a 3 to 5 C error uh, between a calculated temperature and an actual temperature at steady state. Obviously, at your initial state, you're going to have a difference because uh, that's where you, you know, you, you're not reaching the uh, steady state thermal solution. So the benefit from these, um, this, this method is that you can actually adapt to the workload fairly dramatically. And so if you look at a client application today, they are divided into three classes. You have the throughput application that are pegging all the cores. You've got single-threaded applications, and you've got bursty applications because, ap because uh, users are in front of their computers, and they're oscillating between rendering a page for 10 seconds and then stopping and reading it for 20 seconds, rendering a page for another five seconds, and going on. And during that render time, the activity is actually very high, and you can use every single CPU core to render a complex page with a lot of Java animations and Flash and so forth. But, uh, but during the rest time, your temperature is cooling down again. And so you can use the information about calculated temperature to actually run through these periods without relying on uh, knowledge of a uh, average power, which would, be, uh, which, which, uh, would leave something, um, some potential. So um, what you find also is that we want to make sure that when we detect uh, using our microcontroller that we are exceeding the temperature in any one of these hotspots, want to make sure that we can uh, control it fairly cleverly, uh, making sure that we understand what type of application is running as a whole on the APU. Is it a CPU-centric application? Is it a GPU-centric? Is it a collaboration CPU-GPU? Which one do you want to raise faster to, take, to give the power to to improve the overall system throughput? The goal isn't just to raise frequency. The goal is to raise workload, workload performance. So we have some heuristics that we developed uh, to identify when that collaboration between CPU-GPU benefits more from CPU frequency or GPU frequency. Uh, what you see at the bottom here is that the benefit of, of such power management methods increases as you lower the amount of TDP. So all the way to the desktop side, and you're roughly around you know, 100 watt desktop, you'd have 15% higher CPU performance than Lano. And as you go up, you lower into the um, uh, smaller form factors, uh, we increase all the way up to 25 and 35 and beyond uh, uh, percentage upside for, um, for 20 and 35 watts and below. OK, so some of the... Um, uh, uh, power management hardware improvements that we put in. So just looking at the, uh, uh, these are th uh, four different types of workloads that we can run to measure power. So one is, uh, and they measure the total power that's inclusive of the APU plus the Southbridge. 
We're about doing 10% better on idle and mobile marker 7, which is the typical battery life benchmark, and about 20% plus better for uh, multimedia playback. And the reason why multimedia playback improves so much is because we've added a capability to dynamically scale uh, voltage and frequency of both the noise bridge and the memory interface, so we can actually reduce the DDR frequency and reduce termination and drive strength at the same time, thereby yielding very substantial uh, memory saving. And we also improve the ability to select the right frequency for the GPU while retaining real-time ability of the clients. So that's a very key feature because if you have a real-time client, like a multimedia workload, you want to be right at the edge of where you can play it, but you don't want, any, you want, to, don't want to skip any frame. And then for um, a workload that would be a virtual workload of 3 Mark, Trinity consumes higher power, which you would expect since it delivers about 50% higher performance. Um, I'm going to skip through these uh, real briefly. These describe um, the number of um, power islands that we have on the chip. These are all independent power islands. Um, and we can power ind individual SIMDs or um, uh, multimedia IPs or GPU core, and then power down the entire graphics core if you're using none of the graphics pipeline. The last thing I want to talk about is um, smart operational states. So this is a critical feature that we developed for Trinity which is to identify uh, what is the most optimal state you want to run at for the given workload you have at a given um, balanced power operation. So you want to be able to change the memory frequency and at the same time have low latency of those switches that the real-time clients aren't going to be uh, disrupted by those frequency changes. But for that, you have to understand how much memory bandwidth your system really needs in order to sustain real-time operation. Uh, so we've added the capabilities to switch these, these uh, frequencies, but also you rely on heavily on the microcontroller to do workload analysis and identify when is the best time to favor uh, CPU-centric workload, which would be latency-sensitive, or GPU-centric workload, which would be bandwidth-sensitive, and at the same time, rely on hints from the OS as well as static policy from the OS and complex firmware algorithms that are running on microcontroller to detect what's the best operational state. Um, as a result, the uh, frequency selection um, is, is uh, what results in an ideal operational state from a power efficiency standpoint within all the real-time characteristics being met. So this is it. So I want to thank you. And um, this is a summary. You know, Trinity is redesigned for 25% uh, higher CPU performance and 50% uh, higher graphics performance and optimized for, for low power leadership. Thank you very much. Uh, we have five minutes left, so I, I can leave it to... Well, actually, I've taken some of it, so it's more like two or three. Oh, okay. But uh, we can take a couple of questions if anyone has any. Um, okay, I see somebody heading for a microphone. We charge you for walking time. Hi, I'm uh, Sanjeev Jagirdar, Intel Corporation. I wanted to ask a question about the estimated temperature versus the measured temperature. So uh, in case somebody over-designs their cooling, we're actually taking away credit from that system? Um, so, so this is a, today, if, if, not, if nothing is being, depending on the OPN, I should say, so if you're looking at a desktop, um, that might be different. But for notebooks, we wouldn't be taking advantage of it naturally. Now, there are ways of uh, using OEM-specific BIOS changes to allow the OEM to essentially tweak the amount of aggressivity into the algorithm such that you can reduce the amount of margin you have towards what's considered system conditions, but that would be OEM-specific, not AMD's. Um, so, so those hooks are available. In right. Okay, well, before anyone else stands up, I'll thank you very much for an excellent talk. And... We'll start with our next speaker. Our next talk is by George Chrysos, and his uh, talk title is Knight's Corner, Intel's first mini integrated core architecture product. Uh, George has a BS in computer engineering from the University of Michigan. He began his career at Digital Equipment Corporation, which is a name that as long as is sadly lamented, in 1994. He worked for eight years on various aspects of the alpha processors, including performance modeling, architecture and hardware design, and in particular work related to memory dependence prediction, instruction fetch, and memory execution. In 2001, he went to Intel as one of the designers of the bi-directional ring on die interconnect. 
which is found in most of Intel's current processor products. He was the chief architect of Knight's Corner, Intel's first many integrated core architecture product, and is currently the chief architect of a future many integrated core architecture processor currently in development. George? I need a, is this the? Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk about Knight's Corner, which is the code name for the first Xeon Phi uh, uh, processor from Intel. Xeon Phi is a brand name that uh, pertains to the underlying architecture, which we call MIC, or the many in integrated core architecture. Before I dive into Knight's Corner, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the many, instruction, many integrated core architecture. Um, first, firstly, it's targeted at a uh, subset of all workloads. It's targeted specifically at um, highly parallel HPC workloads, things like computational physics, chemistry, biology, and financial services. Um, the nature of these workloads, uh, today they run on uh, large computer clusters and, oops, didn't mean to go on. Um, they run on large computer clusters, uh, compute clusters, and uh, they're just inherently parallel. They're, there's a lot of task level parallelism, and uh, the task is to get as high throughput performance as you can under uh, power constraints and floor planning constraints and so on. And so this was the target of the many integrated core architecture. And so um, optimizing for that type of workload led to microarchitectural decisions in how we build cores, how we build uh, the, the uncore uh, that you'll see in uh, Knight's Corner in a few slides. But another key attribute of the mic architecture is that it's built to provide a general purpose programming environment. Um, it's just like a Xeon programming environment. It runs a Linux operating system, uh, full, full service Linux operating system, um, and it runs applications that are written in uh, Fortran or C or C++. And it supports the x86 memory order model and IEEE uh, mathematics. So, and it brings with it a wealth of uh, good stuff in the software development environment. For example, um, li math libraries, thread libraries, uh, compilers, uh, VTune, which helps you do performance characterization and tuning, and debuggers. So moving on now uh, to Knight's Corner in particular. Knight's Corner is a coprocessor uh, to Xeon. It's connected to the Xeon processor via the PCI Express bus. And um, the PCI Express bus is really just a, the hardware interface. But because the Knight's Corner processor is running Linux and is capable of uh, running anything, it, um, we, we virtualize the TCP IP stack over PCI Express. And uh, then you can actually access Knight's Corner as a network node. So you can telnet into Knight's Corner, bring up a uh, X terminal, run jobs there directly. Uh, you can run batch jobs, send batch jobs from Xeon onto the Knight's Corner. Um, or it enables uh, heterogeneous uh, applications where some processes are running on the Xeon and some processes are running on the Knight's Corner, and they're communicating via either MPI or uh, sockets. So the other thing to notice about Knight's Corner is that uh, you can plug multiple of them into a Xeon, uh, and uh, they can communicate with each other directly via uh, PCI Express peer-to-peer, -peer, which doesn't involve the host. Uh, also, Knight's Corner can communicate to a network card, like an InfiniBand card or an Ethernet card, uh, again, using peer-to-peer -peer transfer uh, without involving the host. So when we first got uh, Knight's Corner silicon back, uh, we built a development cluster. Uh, we call it the discovery cluster. And it's just, it was just to prototype the hardware um, of Knight's Corner plus Xeon. Um, and we put it together, and we use it for debug and development and so on. And uh, we ran Linpack on it. And uh, we got a, a very good score on Linpack, so we uh, submitted it to the top 500. And it came in at like 150th place. It's got um, 140 nodes. Um, and Another interesting attribute is that 
when you look at the power that it consumes, it actually is um, as good or better than any other heterogeneous uh, system in the top 500. Now, uh, this is an early system. It's certainly not optimized. Uh, it'll, uh, and there'll be more performance results, I'm sure, from us and our competitors uh, later. But um, it, what this demonstrates is that you don't need to build a, um, a, uh, new, progr a pr new programming language or um, a new API in order to extract high levels of performance efficiency on compute-dense workloads. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the Knight's Corner microarchitecture. Um, the components are, uh, of course, the cores, and they each have private L2 caches. Those L2 caches are kept fully coherent by a global distributed tag directory. Um, in addition, there are memory controllers that interface directly to the GDDR5 uh, chips that are on the PCI Express card, and we have PCI Express client logic. These are all connected together on Knight's Corner by a very high bandwidth uh, bidirectional ring interconnect. Looking now a little bit more in detail at the core, you can see here that the core is designed uh, with the Mike architecture philosophy, which is um, to uh, consume as little energy as possible while making progress on a multi-threaded or multi-task workload. The processor pipeline is very short. Um, it has four threads supported, and uh, the processor is in order. Now, uh, some people uh, like to know how much does it cost to support uh, IA architecture legacy uh, in the core, and uh, I would measure it at about less than 2% um, of the area cost of the core. Um, and at a full chip or a product level, uh, it's even less than that. So the cost of uh, providing all of this uh, legacy capability to the market um, is uh, very marginal. Now, um, one thing that we also added uh, is Intel's widest SIMD instruction set. It's a 512-bit uh, instruction set. I'll talk more about it on the next slide. And it, uh, the, the ex unit that executes it is called the VPU or the vector processor. So the first thing to note about the vector processor is just its uh, width. It can execute 16, uh, 16 lanes of single precision or eight lanes of double precision operations per cycle. Um, it also has a fused multiply add. So with a single opcode, you can encode um, 32 operations, SP, or uh, 16 operations, DP. It also supports integer. Now, uh, when you widen, and the reason that we do that, by the way, is because uh, the vector units are very power efficient uh, for HPC workloads. A single operation can encode uh, a great deal of work and not have to pay uh, capacitance cost or energy cost for fetching and decoding and retiring uh, in many instructions. But to support wide SIMD, we also add some features to the instruction set. For example, uh, we, ask, we add a mask register file. The mask register file, um, allows you to do per lane predicated execution in the vector processor. Uh, this helps when uh, you're vectorizing across small conditional branches or short conditional branches and uh, also improves software pipelining efficiency. Also, we support gather and scatter instructions directly in hardware. Um, gather and scatter instructions are just vector loads and vector stores that are used when memory addresses are not uh, stride one. Uh, so for uh, more sporadic or, or um, irregular access patterns, you use vector gathers and vector scatters to keep uh, a code vectorized. And uh, we also offer um, uh, the EMU, which is the extended math unit, to improve uh, transcendental types of operations. For example, reciprocal, uh, square root, power, and log. Uh, and these can be processed uh, in a vector uh, fashion uh, with high, high uh, bandwidth. The EMU works by doing a polynomial approximation of uh, those functions. Okay, so stepping out from the core a little bit to the interconnect. The interconnect is, as I mentioned before, a bidirectional ring. Um, each direction has uh, three independent rings. And uh, the first and the largest, the most expensive of these, is the data block ring. 
The data block ring is uh, 64 bytes. That's the size that we needed to support the bandwidth of uh, over 50 cores. And uh, the next uh, ring is the address ring, which is much smaller. And this is the ring that is used to send read and write commands uh, and memory addresses. And finally, the smallest ring is a ring called the acknowledgment ring, which sends uh, flow control messages, like credits between agents, and also uh, sends coherence markers. So the coherence uh, messages are implemented on this third and least expensive ring. Now, when a core uh, accesses its L2 cache and misses, an address request is sent on the address ring to a tag directory. Now, the tag directories are uh, uniformly distributed. So um, a core will access all of the tag directories, and there's an address hash that will uniformly access all the tag directories to give a, a smooth uh, traffic characteristic on the ring. The tag directory will know if any other core, uh, cores L2 or L1, have the block. If they do, uh, the tag directory will send a forwarding request on the address ring to the other cores, L2, and it'll be forwarded by the block ring. If not, the tag directory sends a memory address to the memory controller. And um, this picture shows how memory controllers are distributed on the bidirectional ring. They're actually equally dispersed to get a, again, symmetric traffic pattern. Um, and again, the, the the mapping from tag directories to memory controllers is uh, meant to be all to all. Uh, there's some amount of addressing here that is um, allowing for page hits in the GDDR. But aside from that, the uh, addresses are distributed across the memory controllers and give a very unified uh, access pattern. And so there's no hot spots on the ring, and you get a good bandwidth response. So now, <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about some of the microarchitectural uh, decisions and uh, things that we did uh, pre-silicon that uh, uh, result in the Knight's Corner chip. When I was talking about um, the address path for a memory request, you see that when a core misses its L2, it sends an address request on the address ring, and then it goes to the tag directory. And if it misses in the tag directory, it sends an address request on the address ring and goes to memory. And when the memory controller returns the data block, the data block is returned on the block ring or the data ring. So if you're counting, that's two address operations on the ring and one data block uh, response on the ring. Similarly, there's two acknowledgment messages that are uh, transmitted during this uh, process. Now, um, since the block rings are the most expensive rings and they're built to support the data bandwidth that we need, we had to increase the number of the less expensive address and acknowledgment rings by a factor of two to match this uh, proportion. So um, here I'm showing a chart of uh, a workload, multi-threaded streams triad. And uh, it runs on uh, increasing numbers of cores on the x-axis. And the performance is shown, uh, the relative performance is shown on the y-axis. And what we show here is the uh, pre-silicon, our simulator, uh, what we would have uh, gotten if we only had one address and one acknowledgment ring. The address and the acknowledgment rings would have become the saturation point, And we wouldn't have gotten more scalability for multi-threaded multi triad beyond uh, 32 cores. Now, what we actually built was uh, twice the address rings and twice the acknowledgment rings. And here you can see actual silicon data from Knight's Corner, scaling up to 50 cores and beyond. Um, and it shows that the ad addition of the two uh, rings gives a, a big boost in aggregate bandwidth, over 40%. Now, one other innovation uh, that we made to improve memory bandwidth characteristics was uh, streaming stores. If you look at uh, streams, try it a little more closely. Um, the kernel is reading two arrays and writing one array. 
It's reading uh, array here B and C from memory and writing array A. Now what CPUs uh, would tend to do with this is um, they'll read A before they write A. And why do they do this? Historically, it's because the stores that write A are uh, smaller than cache lines. Sometimes there are optimizations in processors where they try to coalesce and avoid the, the read. But in general, uh, you know, they would do a read and then merge the background data with the store and then write it back out. But here, the vector store is writing a full cache line. So there's no need to read the background data. So we introduced the streaming store opcode that told the coherence uh, engine in the tag directory, don't get the data. I'm going to initialize the whole line. Oops. Um, and when we do that, we see that we reduce the amount of bandwidth that is transferred per iteration um, from 256 bytes to 192 bytes. Now, when we look at the performance impact of this, when we run multi-threaded streams triad, uh, we see that this adds 30% more performance uh, than we had before. So these two changes alone, um, increasing the address and acknowledgment rings and uh, streaming stores, improve the aggregate bandwidth of this workload uh, by over a factor of two. Now, there are other things that we did around uh, the microarchitecture of the core to optimize for HPC workloads. First, we added a second level TLB. Um, we also uh, improved the data cache. So um, we debated between offering a single load or store per cycle. Uh, and we actually can do a single load and we can do both a load and a store per cycle, which helps both with uh, execution bandwidth and reducing the footprint of uh, fills on the issue RAID. We talked about whether we would provide 512 kilobytes or 256 kilobytes of second level cache per core. Um, and we ended up providing 512. And finally, we put in a hardware streaming prefetcher um, into the L2 cache. Uh, the hardware prefetcher is interesting because, in general, the philosophy is that we'll issue software prefetches well ahead of the execution stream. We can issue software prefetches um, at the same time that we're doing uh, vector operations and accessing the data cache. Um, but since the compiler is not perfect, uh, we added this hardware prefetcher. Now, what you see here is the uh, net performance improvement of the changes that we made um, on just single core, single thread performance. Just to get a feeling for how much improvement have we made in the core itself. And here, we're running just spec FP. Again, we can run uh, Fortran and C. We're running just spec FP, and uh, the average improvement is uh, over 80%, and that's per cycle, not including frequency. So I want to talk a little bit about caches. Uh, one thing that we invest in, um, it, what seems to be more heavily than uh, GPUs that I saw earlier uh, in this session, is uh, L2 caches and L1 caches. We have 512 kilobytes plus 32 kilobytes for I and 32 kilobytes for D on each core. And um, why are we investing so much in caches? And by the way, these are fully coherent uh, you know, caches that implement the x86 memory order model. Well, if you look at the aggregate bandwidth that uh, memory can provide versus the aggregate bandwidth that caches can provide, um, it's a factor of uh, seven or so from the L2 cache on Knight's Corner and uh, 15 from the L1 caches. So in order to get really good performance, you need to utilize the caches, right? Um, and and uh, the memory bandwidth subsystem on Knight's Corner is a leading edge memory subsystem. That is a very high bandwidth memory subsystem. So if you look at um, also now considering the energy that it takes to access a byte of memory from, or a byte of, yeah, a byte of memory from the L1 cache, the L2 cache in memory, and then you, you see how much energy are you paying per byte transferred. Again, here we have even a bigger uh, increase. So you can see that transferring data from the L2 cache or the L1 cache is much, much more efficient. Um, and we, when we head into sort of the exascale era, when we want to produce an exaflop computer by the end of the decade, um, getting real performance 
uh, will involve using caches heavily. So let me uh, give one example of this, uh, which is common in uh, physics computing, um, which is stencils. Stencils are a computational method for um, simulating a physical system. So you have a physical model, and you want to do time steps uh, in that physical model and see how it uh, changes over time, and you're computing the forces with each time step. Now, if you just fetch all of the data from memory, then uh, you'll be limited by the bandwidth of memory, and that will be your performance characteristic. However, if the coder is going to put work into tuning the application, then doing cache blocking actually should uh, provide a very big payoff. If you look at, um, you know, imagine blocking the physical structure uh, such that the data fits into a core's L2 cache, then e with each time step, the same CPU core can actually process the data that's resident in that L2 cache. It doesn't have to go to memory. And uh, furthermore, cache coherence plays a huge role here because in order to get the computation correct, the neighbors uh, next to your cache block are being computed by other cores. And they're writing data into uh, cache locations that are on the periphery of where you're operating. And you need those updates in your core to compute the next time step. So here, it's just a wonderful example of how caches are uh, a fundamental tool and fully coherent programmer doesn't need to manage uh, explicitly um, uh, you know, the, the memory coherence caches are working to um, provide a huge improvement for HPC workloads. So lastly, I want to talk a little bit about uh, power management. In a data center where you have uh, Xeon processors and uh, Knight's Corner cards, sometimes the workloads will be using the Xeon processors more than the Knight's Corners. Sometimes they'll be using the Knight's Corners more than the Xeons. Um, and sometimes they'll be using both equally. But um, when you're not in use in solving a problem, then we want to power down as far as we can. And so um, this is just a picture of all of the components on and running. Um, the first thing that we do is when all four threads on a core have halted, uh, we'll clock gate the core at a high level. After the core has been clock gated for some programmable timer, timeout, uh, the core will power gate itself, eliminating the leakage as well. And at any point, any number of the cores can be powered down or powered up. In addition, we have a state where all of the cores have power gated, and the uncore detects that nothing else can happen. Therefore, we're going to clock gate the tag directories, the interconnect, the L2s, the memory controllers. And then um, the host driver can actually put the card into an even deeper sleep state or a deeper idle state where um, the the, all of the uncore is power gated, the GDDR is put into self refresh, and the GDDR IO is consuming very little power. And this is, um, and the PCI Express logic is in a state where it's just looking for a wake up. Um, so, the, the good thing about all of this stuff is that when Knight's Corner is not in use in the data center, that power is, is freed to be given to other components. Uh, or just saving electricity. <clears throat> so in summary, um, Intel Xeon Phi, the mic architecture, provides uh, performance and performance per watt for highly parallel HPC. And it does this with sort of uh, a more traditional architecture of cores, threads, wide SIMD uh, caches, uh, big. Uh, high bandwidth interconnects and memory bandwidth. In addition, it brings forward all the goodness of the Intel architecture, um, providing a, a general purpose programming environment and uh, 
and implementing uh, a lot of the power technology uh, that you see on other Intel processors. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I see we've got one question there to start. Yeah, Al Wagoner with Samplify. Um, I saw on your slides that you had uh, either uh, four GDDR5 memories uh, per side. Um, the slides I have had four each, so a total of eight, and your slides showed five each. <laughs> Could you explain the discrepancy? And also, I, I presume these are not the 384-bit interfaces that we're used to on NVIDIA GPUs to GDDR5. Um, uh, the, um, I, I'll start by saying the Knight's Corner products are uh, not yet announced, and a lot of the uh, details around the product SKUs uh, we're not announcing at this point, but we will be announcing soon. Um, the, uh, all the depictions are not meant to represent how many memory controllers are actually on the chip. So uh, it could have been uh, just a pictorial thing or something uh, in, the, in the difference between my slides and your slides. Yeah. Okay, let's get somebody from this microphone. James Kim with Tensilica. A uh, question about the streaming stores. Yes. Are they a special instruction or an attribute? And what do you do when your stream isn't aligned to the size of the block for the first and last stores of the stream? Yeah, they are a special instruction. Um, they have a certain uh, opcode uh, variant uh, of, a of a regular vector store. Um, although the compiler can use them uh, fairly liberally. And um, what do you do if it's not aligned? Uh, the compiler, if it's not aligned, the compiler will do things like loop peel, um, to, um, which means that you're doing some portion of a loop um, not in a vector uh, code stream. And then you align, and then you, you do uh, vector streaming stores. Hi, John Delaney. I would like uh, to exp for you to explain a small nuance about cache coherency. You mentioned that the one processor can copy from other L2 processors. Yes. Is it possible? Do I have to have thread software loading up data in those other processors, or can I, from one processor, say I want you to buffer in a second in second processor's cache? Oh, um, so are you asking whether there's a direct cache to cache uh, capability? In other words, I can send something to this cache whether he wants it or not. Correct. Uh, no, there's not that capability. It, it, is, uh, it shares data um, just as normal cache coherence does, uh, which is if, the, if a thread is uh, using uh, data in this core, um, in this cache, then it can be um, hit upon by this other core uh, if, if, you know, the tag directory will, will show where it is. So if you want to do that, yes, you could allocate a thread over here that prefetches into that cache if there's a reason to do that. Is that what you did in order to get some of your good benchmark results? No. <laughs> OK. Yaya Mirza from Aurora Software. So this had to do with your, uh, your example and the stencil example. Yes. Um, if you go back and look at the workloads you guys originally used when you were designing Laravee, uh, large of, you know, from my research, it was based on some of the FizzBam work at, uh, at Stanford and then at ILM. But uh, if you look at the, the underlying trade-offs and the algorithms used there, they used what's um, what the methods called implicit. So they, the whole point was they wanted the, the CFD algorithm to be stable, right? Because, uh, and they wanted the, the grids to be as coarse as possible. But if you look at the, the methods that are used in, in, uh, in aerospace for, you know, for the last 20 years, like if you go to NASA Langley or some of, the, some of the advanced CFD tools that are used in aircraft design, they don't use that approach. They use what's called explicit methods, which are a lot more accurate but they also tend to be you know, the, uh, unstable. So the way they address that is they, ad they add adaptivity to it, right? So what this really implies from a hardware architecture perspective is in the model that you guys designed for, you know, you're saying that you're using the, co the coherency protocol for the ghost uh, regions, right? For, for exchanging messages between the regions. But if, if the problem- please, please keep the question yeah, short. If the problem is a, a lot more adaptive, your fill patterns are no. So what this means is your coherency protocol is actually getting in the way, not helping. Okay, I, th I think that's, let, please let him answer. Um, I think I have to understand the case better to, <laughs> to, to comment. Um, I, the coherence protocol, uh, 
doesn't, as far as we can tell, it doesn't get in the way of anything. The tag directories don't send broadcasts or do anything like this. It's really only forwarding when it finds that data is in another cache, right? And so um, it's doing exactly, it's only uh, burning power and, and uh, doing things when there's sharing going on, right? And if there isn't sharing going on, then it won't do that. Now, uh, I'm not sure exactly what case you're pointing to, but uh, we could take it off, offline and talk about it more. Okay, what, two more qu very quick questions, one here and one here. Yeah, uh, Hiro Hayashi, uh, Toshiba. Uh, you mentioned uh, this uh, night core uh, uh, accessed by TCP IP protocol. Does it imply uh, this uh, many core cannot access system memory directly? Correct? Uh, the the um, Knight's corner can uh, access system memory um, over PCI Express. Um, via uh, MMIO. Okay, so it can still do that, but we also implement a virtual TCP IP stack so that um, it can be treated as a full network node. Yeah. Ken Wagner from PMC. Uh, question on your power gating of cores. For yes. your C1 timeout interval, is that something that's calculated probabilistically, or how did you decide that? Because uh, do you have any a priori knowledge of the fact that the core may be asked to come on? You know, uh, just after you decide to turn it off. Um, the um, the the interval timeout is actually uh, fully programmable. So you know, this is you're talking about the transition from core C1 to core C6 when we actually shut off the power gates. Um, all of the information to restart the core is in memory. So um, the latency to restart it from memory is uh, noticeable, but uh, can be done if you're uh, trying to interrupt the processor and wake it up. Um, but it's, it's, it, it's tunable uh, in the system by, um, by software. Okay, thank you very much for another excellent talk.